Now, in the current climate and energy context, the search for sustainable solutions has become a global issue. Recently, American scientists have achieved a technological breakthrough, transmitting solar energy collected in orbit and beaming it back to Earth, a development that could pave the way for a new era of continuous renewable energy production. Joining me now is our science editor, Julia Seeger. Hello, Julia. Hello. Why capture solar energy from space and, and why capture it here on Earth? Well, solar energy is indeed a key renewable energy when it comes to the fight against global change, but it faces numerous challenges here on Earth. First is intermittency because of the day-night cycles that we have, but also uh, because of the weather conditions. If you have clouds, you simply don't have electricity anymore. Uh, there's also the need for efficient uh, energy storage uh, solutions, but also there's a very high initial cost of installations. And this is why, for several decades now, scientists have been trying to harness solar power directly in space. Uh, because it's available in a continuous fashion. There isn't any day-night cycle. Uh, there isn't any intermittency. And it's actually scientists from Caltech in California who were able to uh, develop an incredible project called the Space Solar Power Project. And they succeeded in transmitting this power that was harnessed in space and beaming it back on Earth. Now, this is a huge breakthrough. So the, how did they do it? They developed a demonstrator that they launched in space as early as January for testing. And on that demonstrator, on one hand, you have a transmission network and on the other receivers. On the receiver side, you have solar panels that are going to harness that energy. Underneath, you have these uh, RFICs uh, that are going to convert these microwaves. And then you're going to be able to beam it back wirelessly towards the Earth. And uh, when it comes to the Earth, you have a ground base um, antenna that's going to capture that, and then that's going to be able to convert the radio waves into electricity and send it to the grid. Now, this is a dual achievement because we didn't know how to harness the energy, we, because we didn't know how to beam it back. So this is the science segment, so we're going to do a little bit of physics here, uh, Annette, but uh, how did they do it? Well, they used interference. Interference is something that we all know when you put your hands into water, it creates waves, and either the waves are going to add up to each other or they're going to cancel each other out. So that's interference. So they used that principle, of course, but they also had to find a way to beam back on a specific point on Earth, which was incredible, right, on the Caltech rooftop. And so for that, they had to do what we call synchronization checks, and that's to make sure that the waves that are emitted actually meet in the right manner and are able to be directed in a certain way. Now, I think for our viewers, the most important part, Annette, is to understand that if we're able to scale up this energy, it means that potentially we could get uninterrupted access to solar energy. That means bringing electricity everywhere on Earth, even in the most remote areas and in a sustainable manner. I can tell you now, Julia, my physics classes were nothing like what you just <laughs> did. Now, does the European Space Agency have the same program as well? They do. It's called Solaris, and the idea is to create these huge solar uh, panel farms in space, and it could start as early as 2025. And the agency actually estimates that uh, space-based solar power could represent 10 to 50 percent of all of the energy consumption of Europe within the next two decades, which is absolutely huge. And this is particularly interesting uh, right now, as the race for energy independence is very important in the wake of uh, the Russian-Ukrainian war as well. And uh, when it comes to this technology, there is indeed a huge race. The Chinese have also said that they're launching their own program for 2028. And we could also be able to produce nuclear energy on the moon. What is all that about? That <laughs> it sounds a, incredible. It, is, it does sound incredible, but it's actually a project from NASA. The idea here is not to create energy to beam it back on Earth, but rather to create these mini nuclear reactors on the moon or on Mars to be able to uh, facilitate um, future space explorations on both of those planets. Now, from 2015 to 2018, NASA developed with the Kilopower project uh, a small uh, experimental nuclear reactor. It was called uh, Krusty. It was tested in the Nevada desert <clears throat> as well, excuse me, and it was very successful. And that's why a couple of weeks ago, NASA signed three new contracts with companies to create these surface fission uh, power systems because it is fission energy indeed. So we're really going to see a scaling up of all of those uh, projects in the next couple of years, I think. And finally, scientists have another ambition to exploit space in order to decongest Earth. 
That's right. And one thing that we could try to do is to send our data centers up in orbit. Uh, and of course, those data centers would actually be powered by these space-based solar farms that I just spoke about. And this is what Thales here in France is trying to do, but many other companies as well. Uh, they've been selected by the European Commission to uh, try to figure out the feasibility of this, uh, of this project. And this would be really interesting because we know that data centers consume a lot of electricity, and it's only going to increase in the years to come because of our digital usage. Now, there are other companies that are doing the same. The California-based startup Cloud Constellation, for instance, they were able to raise as early as 2016 5 million euros for their space belt project, which is the satellites uh, that uh, would be uh, in orbit. So they would be uh, the satellites, kind of data data center satellites in orbit and in the cloud. And this is actually a, a funny analogy because this is way beyond the clouds. Oh, it, it <laughs> is indeed. I mean, this is all extraordinary developments. But understandably, you know, scientists are moving in this direction given the problem with limited resources here on Earth. Thank you so much, Julie, Thank you, for Annette. that segment.